a blessing this morning. And I just want to introduce four people to you that God has used in a mighty way just in the recent past uh, here at Bethel Baptist Church. Uh, the Bethel Youth Group Youth Leaders. I want to first introduce you to Tim Shelton. Come on up, Tim. Uh, and I'll just introduce where they're sitting because they're going to come up later. Uh, Wendy Shelton. Hand wave. Jennifer Blankenship. And Kevo Blankenship. Uh, these are the ones that God has truly used to minister uh, to our youth and also to provide these you know, young people a place where they can come and where they can grow in the Lord. So uh, give them a great big hand before Tim starts. Amen? Come on, brother. First of all, that last song is a pretty cool song because it's, it's easy to remember that the gods of the mountain, that our God is the God of the mountain. Amen. We're up high. It's not ever easy when you're low, when you're struggling, when you're going through a hard time. It's never easy to remember that that's the same God. But we got to remember that and praise Him for the good times and the bad. I want to ask Jennifer and Kevin and Wendy to come up with me because they need to help recognize our kids too. Uh, I, I get the honor of being the one that does the talking on this just about every year. This year we've got four that we're going to recognize. One of them couldn't be here. Three of them have been with us for a long time. But I'm going to start off by calling the one that's been here with us the longest up here. Cheyenne, will you come up for me, please? So as Cheyenne is coming up, we got a reminder Wednesday night of exactly how long Cheyenne has been here with us. I think since you could walk just about, right? So Cheyenne's been with us for a long time, and we love her. Amen. The story that we got reminded of how long she's been here with us was actually Wendy the other night because we were talking about how long we had been working with the youth here. And Wendy said, you forget, I taught classes forever before you ever started. She said, I remember when CIA started, what was it, the three and four-year-olds? Three, four, and five-year-old cubbies. Three, four, and five-year-old cubbies, oh, and yeah. Cheyenne was one of them. <laughs> My memory of Wendy teaching that class when I started working with youth, Wendy was working with them kids. I remember her carrying a kid under her arm like a sack of potatoes because the kid was being so bad she was trying to get him to Brother Bill. Oh. Thankfully, that was not Cheyenne. <laughs> that's, that's what we're thankful for, but... Shane, we want to know that we're proud of you, yes. that we see huge potential in you, and we look forward to watching you grow up into a young lady. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So this is a gift from the church that we wanted to get for each one of you guys, so thank you very much. Stay up here for a minute. Now I'm going to call these next two up here at the same time. Bree and Summer, will you come up? For anybody that don't know Bree and Summer, they're sisters. Ramona and Beezus. Jesus and Ramona is what Kevin has called them ever since Kevin got here. They've been with us for quite a while. What, fifth, sixth grade? Is that how long y'all been coming here? Something like that? <laughs> a hot minute anyway. So they've been with us for a long time, and we're very proud of them as well. I'm also going to share a story about the first time we ever took these things up here. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> it was actually the last time we went to Gatlinburg uh, with the youth group kids. And I think Stacy was still helping with the youth then. What I remember most about these two is a couple of things on that trip. We had like a free night where we wouldn't go into the conference and we got to go out and explore town and got to see different things and do different things. So we would just sit on the sidewalk where we could see the kids going into the different stores and really we wouldn't pay in that close attention. I'm just going to be honest as to which <laughs> store they was going to until Bree walks out with what amounted to a machete that she had bought in my store. And then they also bought a lot of candy that night. So they were at about seventh grade at this point. They bought a lot of candy that night. And which, who bought the stuffed animal that caused the incident? <laughs> I still have it. So she bought a stuffed animal. When we get back to the cabin, they get started fighting over said stuffed animal. And before we know it, I think Bree was pulling Summer around by her hair. Or what was the other one? Summer around? had me by the hair. Summer, Summer had Bree by the hair, and we had to separate them. From her. So... <laughs> But they were jacked up on candy trying to fight over a stuffed animal. So that's that's one of the things that I remember about the first time we ever took these two somewhere. But all three of these young ladies have grown up into tremendous young ladies yeah, and are going to be yeah. tremendous women. Yeah. We're already starting to see the fruits in summer. One of the things we were talking about Wednesday nights with the kids, we were challenging them to identify their gifts and use their gifts in church Amen. as they grow older. And summer's already doing that. In case anybody doesn't know, she's helping teach the little kids, the little bitties, with Jennifer.
her own Sundays. So she's already starting to help teach and give back, and I know these other two will soon as well as they grow up. So we wanted to recognize you too and tell you that we're proud of you, and we can't wait. And I'll be there when, uh, Thursday night to watch you. <laughs> so we have Bibles for each one of y'all as well. And the one that couldn't be here, we, we get the honor sometimes since we have pretty young ladies in our youth group. We sometimes get the honor of having their boyfriends to start coming as well. So Jr., if you haven't met Jr., is Summer's boyfriend. And he's been coming for three, four months now. Uh, he's very regular on Wednesday nights and here a lot of Sundays when he's not at his dad's, uh, visiting with his dad or at church with his mom. So he's, he's here with us quite a bit. And Wednesday nights, he's very active in the class. He's talking. He's participating. So we're very proud to have Jr. here with us as well. So we've got a... Bible for him somewhere for you to take it to him, and we'll see him Wednesday night on that. So, if everybody would thank you for letting us be part of your kids' lives, thank you for letting us contribute to them, and we we hope that we've done good enough Amen. and we've done well. So, thank you, everybody. Hey, we all are. See, we get uh, free and somewhere in the middle, and get Wendy over here by Tim. That way, we got the lead, two leaders on either side. There we go. This is picture time, y'all. I thought she could say what time. <laughs> 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 That's a good picture up there. Hang out here. I was looking for Tisha. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think Ramona used to uh, know Beezus. Yeah, this is Beezus. This is Ramona. In case she would looking. feed the count dog her shoes. <laughs> and every year we'd be looking for shoes, and there's the dog over our chewing on every year. She and, better. And, and they sometimes struggle at church camp because they're not morning people. <laughs> I am. She's not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> oh, we are going to have cake in the fellowship hall after for to recognize these three if anybody wants to join us. You know, some of the stories that you hear are kind of like those stories you hear of your children. And they say, well, my mama didn't know this, but uh, that story about the knife is that story I'm glad I didn't know back then. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Why wow, some things are just, it's just good that the pastor don't know. Amen. Uh, I am so incredibly proud of Cheyenne and of Bree and Summer, uh, and I'm thankful for Adults that have been willing to sow their lives into the lives of these young people. And I'll just tell you, I just have uh, the most incredible confidence uh, that God is going to use these ladies in a mighty, mighty way. Uh, I want to thank Jen for getting these Bibles. These Bibles are very, very nice. They're Bibles that have a margin on each side for note-taking. And uh, they're, they're very nice and they're uh, in the NIV language so that our young people can understand them, so the pastor can understand them. Uh, but it's also a great blessing. I, I thank you so much for uh, you as parents uh, being willing to uh, trust this church and these youth leaders uh, with your young people. And uh, they have done a spectacular job and never once have we not been proud uh, of our young people. So I'm thankful for that. Well, I want to uh, speak to you today uh, about the truth about youth. And this is an important because now that these ladies are moving on into college or career or whatever they're going to be doing with the rest of their life, uh, it's going to be of growing importance that we begin to understand the ones that are coming up behind them. Okay? Uh, we, we have a, a, a a blossoming children's ministry right now. And those children one day are going to be where Cheyenne, Summer, and Bree are. They're going to be graduating high school. And they need to be armed. They need to be armed with certain things that uh, only their parents can provide, only their church can provide. And so I want to speak to you a little bit about the truth about youth so that we can know how we should go about uh, raising up these young people. On April the 20th in 1999, in a small town of Littleton, Colorado, school students Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold went on an all-out assault on Columbine High School. 
if you don't remember it, the plan of the boys was to kill hundreds of their fellow students with guns and knives and homemade explosives. When all was done, 12 students, one teacher, Dylan and Eric, were all dead. And while that's not the only one, there have been many other similar events. The same question rings true in every one of those stories. And the question is simply, why? Why did that happen? Why did that happen? In almost every case... They were lost, unloved, and maybe unwanted. And that brings me to my topic today. As parents and as a church family, does it ever seem like, even in spite of what we're witnessing today with these ladies, does it ever seem like that as a nation, we're losing our young people. Many of our church members are involved in school in some shape, form, or fashion, whether that be in teaching or mentoring or cafeteriaing. Amen. Um, and they know our kids. And, you know, a lot of times they, they get to see the, the, the rough side of young people. But as children grow, grow older, it seems like a lot of times they often begin to lose interest in spiritual matters. It seems like they begin to pull away and maybe even become distant, not only with their parents, but also with the church. And therefore they start missing church. And then maybe they just stop going altogether. Then they start dating and Maybe they get engaged, and then maybe they end up marrying a non-Christian. And sometimes they get involved in drugs, they get involved in alcohol abuse, and they get involved maybe in the other temptations that the world offers. And sadly, when those things happen, we risk losing our young people. So as a church and as parents, I want to reiterate the obvious. I want to reiterate the fact that as parents and as a church, we have a responsibility for our young people. It's not just a blood relationship. We have a responsibility for our young people. Not only as parents... But as a church, and I believe that Proverbs 22.6 truly is a great principle by which we can take responsibility for our young people. And the Bible says, train up a youth, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now friends, several factors contribute to the process of losing our youth. But understanding why those factors take place might help us prevent losing more of our young people. So the first factor that we find that contributes to the process of losing our youth to the world is the bad influence of friends. Friends often are the most influential on youth. Why is that? Because that is who they're spending the most time with. Amen? They might just get three or four hours with their family in the evening. They might get uh, an hour or two through the week uh, with their church family, but they're spending eight hours a day with their friends. But there are warning signs that a specific friend might be a bad influence. And Solomon gives us this in Proverbs chapter 1. Listen to what Solomon wrote to his son. 
He said, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Don't you give in. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like a shoal and whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious possessions. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in your lot among us, they say. Let us all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path. Friend, the bad influence of a friend can lead a young person down a destructive path. Even good Christians... Even good Christians can be led astray by a bad friendship. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 26, Solomon wrote, A righteous man is cautious in friendships, but the way of the wicked leads him astray. The Apostle Paul himself, perhaps more than anybody else, he recognized that friends can mislead you. Here's what he wrote to a church. He said, don't you be misled. Don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Even a good Christian can be led astray by a bad friendship. So how is it that our young people get led down this path of destruction? Well, several reasons. I believe at least number one, like anyone, they begin to gradually Drift. Ever, anybody ever been there? Skip one time, and then the next time it's that much harder to go back, isn't it? Uh, start skipping your personal time with God, and then all of a sudden it becomes increasingly difficult to get back in the groove. They begin to gradually drift. And the book of Hebrews warns us about this. In chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, We must pay more careful attention. Therefore, to what we've heard, to what we've learned, to what we've experienced, so that we do not drift away. The Bible warns us about drifting. But there's a second reason that we're led, that our youth are led down this path of destruction. And that is, like many adults, they begin to get desensitized to sin. Anybody ever heard of a white lie before? Anybody ever heard of that, just that little lie? Or that little sin, that's the result of being desensitized to sin. And the Bible warns us about that too in Psalm 1.1. The Bible says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of mockers. The Bible is real clear. Don't be desensitized to sin. Sin is sin. It's real. And it will lead you down a path of destruction. Now there's a third reason that our young people can be led down this path. And that is, most of all, pressures begin to mount when they feel outnumbered. When they feel outnumbered by worldly people, they begin to just fit in. And go right on with the same things that they're doing. But you know what? God warned about this too. In the book of Exodus chapter 23, God was talking to his people. And he basically said, don't follow the crowd in doing wrong. Don't follow the crowd in doing wrong. Do not let them live in your land or they will cause you to sin against me. Because the worship of their gods will become a snare to you. You see, God didn't want His people, God didn't want the Hebrews to fall victim to the influence of those other so-called religions. God didn't want His own to fall victim to the influence of the culture characteristics that they would find in the promised land. In the land that we're living in today, friend, youth find all manner of culture characteristics that can influence them. And we need to be aware of that. So the bad influence of a friend. It truly is a factor in losing our youth. But did you know, so is the second factor. Which is the poor example of parents. 
Now, this is where some of you might start to squirm. You might start to feel a little bit uncomfortable here, but remember what we're talking about. We're talking about our kids here. We're talking about our children here. We're talking about tomorrow's leaders here. We are talking about the next generation of leaders here. And so that's pretty important, wouldn't you say? Our youth, I believe, are the most precious gift given to us by God. Because they influence not only today, but they influence our tomorrows as well. And at least part of the reason why we're losing them is because young people learn from what they see. Okay? Young people learn from what they see. Jesus instructs us in Matthew 5.16 to let our light so shine before men that they will see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. If that principle applies to God's people, guess who else it applies to? It applies to parents as well. Your young people see what you do. Not only hear what you say. So therefore, it is the duty of every parent to let your kids see you living for God. It's imperative for your child to let them see you setting an example. It's important for them to see you following God's direction in your life if you want them to do it in their life. Why? Because young people learn from what they see. But also, like it or not, children will become like their parents. I didn't say identical replicas. They won't become exactly like their parents. But you can put this in the bank. They're going to be like their parents. Proverbs 20 verse 7, God's word says that the righteous man leads a blameless life. But listen, blessed are his children after him. Ezekiel 16, 44 speaks to mamas. Ezekiel said, everyone who quotes Proverbs will quote this proverb about you. Like mother, like daughter. We're going to become like our parents. Youth will invariably talk like their parents, eat like their parents, think like their parents, walk like their parents, respond like their parents, and act like their parents. So what we need to do as parents is we got to give them a target to shoot at. A good target to shoot at. We've got to get them a good goal to work toward. We need to give them a good pattern that they can clearly see. And friend, in so doing, you will give them something that gold or silver could never buy. Why? Because not only friends, do they learn from what they see? They're going to become like our parents. But also, as parents, how many of you know that your actions speak louder than your words? Uh-oh. If your actions speak louder than your words, then you need to make sure that you don't just tell them that you love them, but that you show them that you love them. Okay, Bill, how do I do that? Well, one of the ways, Proverbs speaks of it in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 12. Listen carefully. My son, do not despise the chastening, the discipline of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects. Just as a father, the son in whom he delights. So how does God love? He loves by disciplining. Right? Discipling his children. Discipling his young people. Not just telling them, but showing them how to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. They need to see you practicing the Christian values that you're training them to take into their own lives. So don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when your young person turns out just the way you trained them. To be. 
because they're going to be like their parents and they're going to learn from what they see. And it's because your actions speak louder than words. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, God spoke to this, to his own people. And here's what he said. He said, listen, you people. Listen, my people. Be careful and watch yourselves closely. Watch yourselves closely so that you don't forget what your eyes have seen, what you've learned, what you've experienced. And then teach them to your children and their children after them. So this brings into light that, hey, we're not only talking about our own kids, we're also talking about our grandkids, right? So no matter how old we got, uh, we're still in this process of training up young people. It's so important. In many cases, today's young people have the bad influence of friends. Sometimes they have a poor example of parents, but there's something else that they've got going against them. And that is the third factor. The weak image of the church. You know, from the time that children are old enough to pay attention to what goes on in church, they begin to form this image. They form this image of the church, but they also are forming an image of Christianity as a whole. What image is being formed for our young people here at Bethel Baptist Church. Is it one of compassion and training and teaching and loving and showing and exampling? The image of a strong church, the image of a, a faithful church is very powerful. And it can last long into the lives of our children. But what do they need to learn? What do young people need to see from the church and from us as members of the church. Well, first of all, they need to get help understanding the Bible. That's what we do in life groups. That's what we do on Wednesday. Not only understanding the Bible, but then also learning how to apply it in their lives. Right? I mean, think about it. If we don't teach our kids about the Bible, who's going to? Exactly. Nobody. So that's our responsibility. But they also need to see and learn something else. They need to see the Bible in action. They need to see the Bible in action in you. They need to see the Bible in action in all the lives around them. But they also need to see the conviction and the strength of the church. Our young people need to look in our church and they need to be able to see role models. They need to be able to see pillars in the community people that are standing up for Christ but they also need to know that sin insults God they need to see that in our lives not the sin but the fact that sin insults God and as they learn they need to learn that hey buddy sin doesn't come without consequences you can sin if you want to but Katie bar the doors afterwards, amen? Because consequences are coming. But they also need to see people, perhaps most of all in the church, that love and respect one another. I don't know how many times he said it, but it was a bunch. Jesus said, love one another. Love one another. Love one another. And I think that's what our young people need most of all, is to learn how to love one another. That's what they need to learn in church. That's what they need to learn from you. But often, and unfortunately, young people often see a bad image of the church. Often they listen to preaching that is weak, hard to follow, and maybe even outdated. Some preachers preach one thing and do another. How hard is that for a young person to follow? They see in a bad image of the church, they go to their life group or their Sunday school class, and the class is completely irrelevant. It doesn't speak into their life. They can't even come out of their understanding. How does this, this lesson, how does this Bible apply to me? That's a bad image. 
And then that image is our young people witness hypocrisy in its members. They hear you preaching one thing. They hear you teaching another thing. But then when you're out at the ball game, they see you acting like a fool. Right? They see you, they, they see you at the store buying and purchasing something you ain't got no business. Right? And I believe that may be the biggest problem that some churches have. It's the hypocrisy within the family. But another bad image is, is they hear grumbling about one another. Young people witness backbiting amongst its members. They learn real quick that if a church member will stab one person in the back, then it's probably not too long before they get one themselves. So that cannot be. Another bad image is they're forced to attend outdated worship services, outdated ministries. And we need to keep in mind as a church family friend that, listen, this message, it never changes. But the method of delivery can. Amen? The message never changes, but the method in which we deliver this message can change. And so we need to make it appropriate and applicable and relevant to our young people. Did you know that some churches don't even have any youth ministry? They don't have any youth ministry at all. They don't have any activities at all. And they wonder, why would our young people want to be out partying with their friends rather than coming to church? What image does an unsupported youth ministry say to young people? I'll tell you what it says. It tells them, we don't care about you. If we have an unsupported youth ministry, here's what it says. You are not important to us. That's what it says. And I'm so thankful that our church family is so supportive a Bethel youth group and always has been. I mean, there has never been a single time that the youth leaders had come to the church in need of this or that or anything in between and the church family has not supported them 100%. This, this youth camp that we're going to, 27 members, did you know that the youth fund, the youth uh, budget, pretty much pays for all of that? How much money are we talking about? Thousands and thousands of dollars to make sure that your child, your young person, goes to youth camp where they can be exposed to the glory of God being manifest in that kind of place. Thank you, church, for supporting Bethel Youth Group. Again, I am so thankful, friends, for the countless hours... You don't hear about them all. But I'm thankful for the countless hours put forth by our Bethel Youth Group leaders. And I'm going to ask them to stand up one more time. Miss Wendy, Wendy Shelton, Jennifer Blankenship, Kevin Blankenship, and Tim Shelton. Amen. <clears throat> These folks put forth those hours above and beyond what you'll ever know. Ball game after ball game after ball game after ball game. Phone call after phone call after phone call after phone call. Text, Instagram, Snapchat after Snapchat after Snapchat. Right? Sometimes they don't want to hear some of that trash, right? Uh, but anyway, they know they speak their language. Right? And they're willing to pour forth those hours on their own accord, completely voluntarily. And just think what we, where we'd be if we didn't have them. Well, we'd have an unsupported youth ministry where our young people said, hey, they don't care about us. We're not important to them. So I'm thankful that our youth truly have a place to come and to grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. People that are dedicated. And I'm thankful for a church that supports them like you do. What a blessing. You know, in part, you're responsible for what Cheyenne and Bree and Summer 
are experiencing. You, know, you didn't go to class with them, but you know what? You sure did support them. And I think there are ways that we support our, our, our young people uh, that are so valuable. And I'm so glad that I serve in a church that does that. Today's young people, they might have the bad influence of friends. They might have a poor example in their parents. They might even suffer through a weak image in the church. But then they got one other thing going against them. And that is the pull of the world. Even though this is my last point, this is probably the number one reason why we're losing our youth. Even in the church, I think, that sometimes we judge our kids unfairly. We judge our kids sometimes by the way that they look. Maybe they got long hair or tattoos or piercings. Maybe we listen to the, hear the music they're listening to. I can't understand why anybody would like Christian rap, by the way. Amen. But some of them like it, right? Some of them listen to, to Christian heavy metal. Great. I don't know why they do, but great. So here's what I say. If they got long hair or man buns, I got you covered, brother. I, mean, I love you, man. Who cares? It don't mean that God loves them any less. It means that I love them even more. Sadly, sometimes teenagers find more acceptance in the world than they do here at church. That's a problem. It's a big problem. No wonder they're drawn more to the world than they are to a church. I mean, think about it. The world uses technology. They got technology. Most churches are way behind the curve in what they offer their young people in this area. I mean, in most cases, if a young person can't download it, if he can't look at it, then it ain't cool and he don't want it. That's just the way it is. But the world also uses the internet. And now the internet gives our teens access to a whole lot more than they should ever have access to. A Google search will get you the following results. Pornography, 85,200,000 sites. Sex, 1,640,000,000 sites. Jesus, 591,000,000 sites. I say, praise God, Jesus beat out pornography, amen. But he kind of fell short of sex. These are pretty scary statistics for what is coming against our youth, for the kind of temptations the world is offering our young people. So you might say, Bill, in light of all these things that are going against our young people, how can we win them back? How can we keep them from straying in the first place? Now I pray that this is not an oversimplistic solution. But here it comes. The bottom line is this. The church must be more influential than the world. We got to make a bigger difference in the lives of our young people than the world ever could. It's going to take things like the time and dedication that our youth leaders have poured into our young people. Not only in this generation, but in generations past for 113 years here at Bethel Baptist Church. We must be more influential. We got to be a good example for them, not only as parents, but we got to be a good example for them spiritually. We got to get them involved in the church that really cares, that really cares for them and provides for them. And also provides solid adult support. That's how we can win them back. That's how we can keep them from straying in the first place. But finally, as God's family, as 
the church family, as our young people's church family, we need to always follow biblical standards. Like the ones we find in Ephesians chapter 6, where Paul writes, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Wouldn't you like your youth leaders teaching your kids that? Somebody say amen. Right? I mean, wouldn't we like uh, our, youth people, our youth leaders teaching our kids this? Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Wouldn't you want your kid to be learning that? Wouldn't you want your child to, to be learning uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4? Where the Bible says, be careful and watch yourselves closely. Teach them to your kids and to their kids after them. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a youth in the way he should go. And when he's old, he won't depart from it. Training up, friend, is hard work. You don't train up your youth by sending them to church one time a week. It's every day. Over and over again. Repetition is the parent's greatest tool. Teaching them over and over again. Now what's going to happen if we don't do these things? What's going to happen to our young people if we choose not to get them involved, not to be a good example, and not to always follow biblical standards? Here's what's going to happen. Alcohol abuse. Here's what's going to happen. Drug abuse, maybe even drug addiction. Trouble with the law. Maybe trouble with pornography. Poor habits that may lend them to fall into a tragic end. That's what could happen if we don't get with it. But I want you to know today that ultimately, a vibrant, ongoing, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ is one way to win your child to win our youth, and to make sure that our youth don't drift away. See, Jesus really is the answer. He really is the answer if we want any person to be won back. And if you don't believe me, then you just ask me. Because you are looking at the personal embodiment of Proverbs 22.6. Train up a youth in the way he should go. And when he's old, I ain't old. When he's old, he won't depart from it. You see, when I turned 17 years old and my mother and father were divorced, mom and my brother, we immediately moved hours away down to Orlando. And I moved from a church where I was plugged in and getting fed, had, had youth leaders like we do here at Bethel sewing into my life, going on mission trips, teaching Sunday school, doing vacation Bible school, doing all manner of activities. But when I got taken out of that family and moved to Orlando, I didn't plug back in. And you know what started happening? I began to drift. And before, before long, I started getting desensitized to sin. And then I felt un outnumbered and I started walking down this path of destruction that almost led to my personal tragic end. By the grace of God, after 17 years, I returned to the way I should go. A living embodiment of Proverbs 22.6. It's legit. It's biblical. And it's true. I pray that you'll begin to have the passion that Bethel Baptist Church has for young people. And that you'll begin to understand just how truly important they are. Because if we just let them go, their friends... 
the world will take them down a path of destruction that will break your heart. But like I mentioned, more than anything, we got to begin with this legitimate, intimate relationship that comes through Jesus Christ. That's why the investment of time, blood, sweat, and dollars goes into the, this youth camp. Because we know that's where it begins. It begins with a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've been a, a Bill Barlow. Maybe you've been like me and you started down a path of destruction and you started to get desensitized to sin and maybe you've begun to drift. I want you to know that today your God waits for you with open arms and you can make a decision today to follow Him, submit to His will, and you can be saved today. You just follow whatever the Lord is saying to you. Be obedient to God. Amen? Let me pray for you. Our Father in heaven, we rejoice at this opportunity to share the truth about youth. And Lord, we thank you so much for your love and your affection, for your compassion, and I guess in my case, most of all, for your incredible, amazing grace. Lord, thank you for not letting me go. Lord, thank you for not letting me go the way I was being led. Thank you for gracefully and lovingly redirecting me back into the way that I should go. Father, I can't help but believe that there's someone else in this room that's got the same experience as their pastor. Father, if it's time for somebody to come home, Lord, I pray you'd use this service to do it. And that, Lord, I'm not who I used to. And that you would be encouraging them and drawing them to you. Lord, again, we thank you for our young people. We thank you for our leaders that teach them. And now we ask you for your mercy and grace during this decision time. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said.